I was 13 years old when I was baptized into the church. And that was upon me realizing that something wasn't right. And I was a little different in that I didn't have no big burden. For me, I, I was honest as I knew how to be. And, and uh, I just said that I knew I would be lost if I wouldn't surrender to Christ. But when I was saying to Christ, really what everybody knew I was meaning is to the church. And the baptism was always baptized into the church. You know, it's not being baptized into Christ. It's being baptized into the church. And so your submission is to the church. My dad would have been one that would have been a strong uh, supporter of believing in Jesus in that system. Yet he believed 100% in the system. So how can you believe 100% in a system that expels people for minute things, even while they say they believe in Christ? And, and, and you know, so it, it's just, it's confusing at the best. I, I don't, you know, a lot of my uh, growing up years, I, I, you know, I would, I was reading all those Bible stories, you know, and you know, as as a child, and and about Jesus and about the apostles and about all the Bible characters, and but I, it, it ain't the same as what I have today. The journey from Christ and the church mixed together to uh, faith in Christ alone is a, is, was a long journey for me. Uh, it, it, it seemed like it just gradually, uh, I began to, my eyes began to become more open and open and I began to see more and more. And finally, with time, I was always concerned as a, as a minister um, about all these young people uh, being baptized into the church and very few of them knew anything at all about Jesus. Very little was being said. It was, we wanted to be in the church, we wanted to be baptized to have the, uh, to have the approval of the people. That was what we was looking for. So a lot of my first experience was getting that approval. And once, because if you're not baptized in the church, my grandma, my, all my people would say, well, aren't you uh, willing to, to uh, give your life to Christ? And they wouldn't say that. They'd say, aren't you willing to be a church member? Aren't you willing to, why aren't you baptized? And, you know, finally that gets old, you know, you get tired of hearing that. But, but my conversion, I believe, was clear in what I understood at that time. But when I came, to me, I was at that process tell when I came to know Christ alone, where I had the peace in my heart was probably, it was after I was expelled sometime to where I would say that I could look up and I knew without a doubt I was accepted and at rest. The election process is just a congregation deciding that they, they answer three questions, whether this is the time, whether there is the gift, and there's another one I can't think of right at the moment, but, and if those are all three are in affirmative, they have an election. And everybody just writes on a piece of paper who they think it might be. If you get 51% of that vote, you're automatically in. Well, approaching this time, there's always talk in, in the congregation about, you know, who's it going to be? You know, who is it? It's always somebody from among us here. So who's going to be the minister? And who's it going to be the next one that's going to be elected? You kind of get a sense if you, you know, know much of how that goes. You know, who's at that age? There ain't that many of us. And who it could be. Normally, it's always somebody within 25 to 32 to 33. So that age group you kind of know. So... After being raised in that and always looking up to those ministers, those ministers that come for revivals and always watching that 
and always uh, having that, uh, I don't know, just being all struck with these men that get up and lead everything. Uh, that was a lot of, it was, I guess in my heart, I wanted to be somebody like that. And, and in one way, that was part of my call. I wanted to be faithful. I wanted to do what I seen was, was right. So leading up to that election, the, the congregation would try to have an election and it failed. They failed like uh, twice in two different other times. There, would, there was nobody elected because there was no, n nobody come up high enough on the list to get to 51%. So, but the year that it happened, intuitively, I don't know how it was, I told my wife, it's going to happen this time. I may as well get ready. And it happened. Went there that night. Sure enough, I was elected. Which they consider that, you know, a great big thing that this is a great big call and which when I look back on that I think a lot of people have the same call that I had and that was a call to be faithful a call to minister to others in need you know we you have your natural makeup your own talents you kind of know you have those and I wanted to help people so after that election process we was put in I was put in and of course the wife by your side, you know, she's, she's not ordained at all. She's just, but when you answer those questions, it always asks her, will you support him in this calling? And of course she did. And I think she was somewhat hesitant, but <laughs> because she knew what this was gonna require. So when you, once you get in, uh, we, started living our lives and you get up in front of church and I never went to seminary I didn't I, you know I'd studied the Bible some but uh, supposedly by inspiration you're supposed to just automatically know how to preach well I did the best I could and some of the things that I studied and the things that really meant something to me were a lot about who Jesus was and that was a lot of what started the process for me of coming to where I am today because I would be, many a night I would sit and study different books and different old preachers. Spurgeon was one of them that really impressed me. I would read them sermons and we'd sit there and my wife would sit there with me and we'd just cry because this is the gospel and we had never really heard it before. So it was so impactful. It would, we would just sit there and cry. And, and, and I would, uh, from some of that is where my sermons came from. So when I'd get up and preach, this is probably the, one of the biggest disappointments I had of my ministry, is to get up in front of a congregation and preach about Jesus, the one that was starting to mean so much to me of who he really was. And, and the only answer to people's problems, the only healing that people could get, and, it, and everything just be dead. I'd walk off the rostrum and nobody would say a word. Because it, he wasn't precious to, to them, it didn't seem like. They wanted to hear more about uh, submission to the church, uh, getting our clothes right, having the right car, and a lot of those kind of things. And it was very disappointing. So, so after a, a time, the, the, the big thing with a new minister is they definitely want you to go to these annual meetings every year. So, which I wanted to go. I was an eager beaver preacher and I wanted to get up there. So sure, I was there on time, I was there early. And, and I'd have my suit on when I come off the plane over there, wherever we was going. And, but after starting going to those meetings, I'd hear, you know, you'd, when we'd get there, from the start, we'd get there, a whole group of preachers and deacons. First things we'd be hearing is, are you being faithful to your calling of watchmen on the walls of Zion? Are you really, are you really, 
keeping the church pure? Are, are you willing to discipline? You know, are you willing to really be faithful to the church and no matter what it takes? And a lot of those, those meetings were fairly intense with a lot of things that they would have called the drift. Very little, if hardly any, was ever talked about our faith in Christ and getting people to come to understand who He really is. It was all about regulations. And I've got a whole stack of minutes over there. I can get them out and just start going through it. Every talk is about the drift or about casual living. Uh, you know, these are all the concerns. It's about, it's about big collars on dresses or the head covering being too small or, uh, you know, our young people wanting to play ball too much or, or the weddings are too big or... And hardly ever in those discussions, a few times I remember, there was somebody would come up and, and talk about who Jesus is and what a change that would make on this topic, you know, of what he would, how he would change this. Very few times, hardly ever. Most of the time, we'd be there three days or longer and not ever a word being said about that. And, and I would get in the car if we would drive there, if we flew, and I'd start talking to my wife on the way home. I'd say, I don't know what the deal is. The, the only answer we have, we don't talk about. The only answer to people's real heart need, what really changes the inside, we say nothing about. We just talk about getting everybody in this little box and, and corralling them enough that they'll all be good church members. So that was, to me that's probably the biggest damage to a young preacher in that church. We'd come home from there with this big burden on our shoulders that I have to keep all my people in line. The young people have to be going straight. They can't be dri driving the wrong car. They can't be wearing the wrong shoes. They, they can't be, um, you know, doing anything with technology that they're not supposed to do. They've got to be dressing right. And so when we came home with that, finally that has an effect on a minister especially on a young man that's, you're trying to do what's right. And you start feeling that. And every, so every year you go to that and you come back and you're a little more weighted down. So then we would go to, be called to go to uh, revival meetings in other congregations. And for me, that was another big eye opener because I'd get to these congregations. And if, if I'd you start telling you stories, I can tell you a story about, about every place I went where uh, these staves were having problems, a lot of fighting among them, uh, problems that they couldn't solve. And I mean, just, I can tell you about the first one where I went one time. I got, we got to, uh, went to Wisconsin, got there with this other minister, and we started preaching. Uh, about the second night, here came a couple. And they wanted to talk to this. The other minister was an older minister that they knew, and they really liked him, and so they wanted to hear him speak, and they wanted to visit with him. Uh, so we finally got the opportunity. They, the pastor there had to call the other pastor from where they was from. It was just a town over, another congregation, another Holdeman church. And they had them, they let them come in. But they had to come and police it. They wouldn't allow just me and this other preacher and this staff there at that church to visit with them. They had to be there and police it too. So there they all sat and here these people come in and, and they're looking for help. Well, everything's against them. There's no way. 
the guy I was with, he was kind of a nice guy, and he, 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 he said right off the bat, he said, let's, let's don't tell them how bad they are. Let's, they, they're looking for a key. Could we just give them a key? So we, let, we, we listened to them and then let them go out of the room and talked it over, and, and they came back, and, and he, he kind of led that and t said, well, you know, we kind of like what you're saying, but could you do some more of this, or could you look into this area, you know? And a lot of it was about offendedness and, and really damaged, damaged from the other ministers of their authority overpowering them, really, what, what it's all about. <laughs> and so, you know, he encouraged them to learn how to forgive and forget and go on, you know. But we couldn't, they wanted to visit again. That other staff wouldn't let us because it was going around them behind their back, you know, so, so that stopped that. that. That was the kind of thing I encountered a lot. When you would like to show grace and mercy, it wasn't allowed. Everybody's watching everybody, and no matter where you are in the system, there's, you, there's somebody you need to please. And there's, so there's somebody watching over your shoulder if you're, if somewhere you might be allowing something or, and it all has to do with the one true church doctrine because, uh, I mean, if you ever become weak on that, you're in trouble in a hurry, in a real hurry. So you're trying to satisfy, and especially as a young man when I was coming up in this, I wanted to be approved of. I wanted the approval of those older ministers and I was under older ministers. So they would be telling me, you know, that how we do things. Well, finally you get a little, I start getting a little older and I start learning a few more things. And I mean, you can just, just like a wedding proposal, for instance. I had a young couple, they came to me and they was, they was visiting and the, the young man did and he was, you know, he was wanting to propose to this young lady um, but, and, and I visited with him and I, and I felt like he was in the clear and, you know, finally it was as good as could be for young people and they were in love. And so I went and visited with the other couple other of the ministers there and we all agreed that, that we'd carry the proposal. Well, we no more and agreed that and then some of the other staff members, the deacons, heard about it. And they said, well, them two ain't ready to get married. So, so what's happening here is they're questioning me whether I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so uh, it got pretty tense because they're going to call off the wedding. And it's already been announced. And we're going to call this wedding off. So finally, I had to have a little, went into a little room and we had a talk with, with, this, with the group of staff that we were there. And I said, if you have a problem with me, let's, let's go ahead and talk with me. But let's don't destroy our people. But so a lot of times this is what happens. So behind the scenes, I, had to, I went to that father and I said, you had better get your daughter and everything in order now or this wedding's going to be called off. You don't have a choice. She better get all her wardrobe cleaned up, her shoes cleaned up, whatever it takes. Whatever you think there's a question with, get rid of it. Well, really in my heart, I didn't believe none of this. But to satisfy all these others, you don't have a choice. And I didn't tell those people. You know, I'm not telling them at all because if I tell them, then they would know that this thing ain't working and we can't tell that. So that was the last that was ever said about that one. But when it comes to other problems in the church, a lot of times there'd be somebody would have some kind of an issue and boy, we'd call them in and we'd sit around there and decide what their problems were and seldom was it, you know, your faith in Christ or anything to do that. It would always be with some, something about their operation, their, their 
their business or their clothes or whatever it was. You know, we didn't we didn't help people. We just you know run them in the ground pretty well. That's the way I would say. There's a long distance between the leadership and the laity. And what I mean by that is they're not honest with us. They, they look at us and, and, and honor us in front of everybody, but when they go back behind, behind everybody else, they a lot of times, they weren't saying the same thing behind our backs as they were saying to us because of fear. If they told us everything, we'd have something was wrong with it and they'd get in trouble. So uh, I just, I, I accepted that after, and, and I knew that when I went into it, after a while I wouldn't have any friends. And it's pretty well that way. All my friends were ordained friends that were in the same level I was in. It's pretty well the way it was. It's a way of life that people accept, but there's really, a lot of it, there's no blessing. Yeah, it's just the, the, there's not the blessing of Christ. There's not the blessing of complete peace and rest. Yeah. So it's just this thing, you, you know, they'd come into revivals and say, you know, and we'd have revivals every year, so they'd come into revivals and say, uh, well, I lost out about, two weeks after last revival. And, but I feel like God has picked me up again now. And, you know, and, uh, and now I got courage to go on. I mean, it's the type of thing that, uh, it's a performance-based religion, so if you're performing and you can maintain your performance, you feel fairly good about yourself, and you feel like everything's going pretty good. But when you, when you're, when your water runs out, you can't do it anymore. You can't paddle your own boat, and, and, and you've got to figure out a, another way to get that going again. <laughs> it's, a, it's a process. The one true church issue is one thing they won't talk to you about. You, and even when I was in there, I wouldn't talk about it. Really? No, I would not talk about it. Well, we'd always have a few scriptures we would use, but we didn't want to talk about it. In fact, in, in our community, we've had a, we had a couple of other people that, you know, were acquainted with some of the Holdeman group, and they would like to challenge us about the One True Church teaching. Yeah. And that happened twice in the last several years. They would start having Bible studies and they no more get started. I was never a part of those, but I would hear about it. They would get started, and they, the Holdemans were thinking they were getting these people to come to the Holdeman church, but then they were always asking about the, the one true church teaching, and, and it wouldn't be very long. They'd be upset, and they'd say, we don't, we don't need to have them Bible studies no more. That ain't working, and it'd be all dismissed. And any time I've, since I've been out, tried to talk to them about it, there's no, there's no open door to talk about it because there is, they don't want to discuss it. it it's a, that's an off topic. And because I, I think most people know that there's something wrong with it, but they've been taught it so long, they know if we lose it, we've lost everything. So, in, rather than lose all of that, they're willing to just let it go. As I became more enlightened about who Jesus really was, and who he really is, and as he be began to have more effect on my life, and the more I seen about that, and I seen how we were treating people, the more convicted I was. So, I kept, I started talking about that, and that run me into a lot of trouble because uh, at one point in time, they had already set me down and said I was not supposed to preach anymore, and uh, take out, they took all my responsibilities, my conference uh, committees, and all right. that, 
Well, they took that all away from me because they got a dis they was disciplining me. What'd you do? Well, that was over. I didn't do nothing. I just never, never called another committee member, never did another thing. It was over. That was done. I know, but what'd you do wrong? Nothing. Uh, they couldn't, I don't think any of them could tell me anything I'd done wrong except, <laughs> I, I don't think they knew what I did wrong. But, and, and, they, and they couldn't discuss it. But they would have said I, was, I wasn't being teachable, you know. So, yeah, I mean, that was just... You were just starting to see a little differently than them? Well, when you start understanding who Jesus is and you yeah. start showing grace, yeah. that doesn't work in that system. Okay. Because you don't expel people for nothing anymore, you know. Yeah. You, you go to them and introduce Jesus. So anyway, at one point in time of, of in that process, it took about five years before I was expelled when this kind of started and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, and they would have visits every so often. So uh, at one point in time, they decided to just let me go free. So they got a whole committee together and, and at that time I was traveling, I was leaving, I had to get away. So we was working, doing dirt work I would travel over Texas and Oklahoma and I took all my family with me and we went everywhere, wherever we went, that's where my family went. And they came and found us in Perkins, Oklahoma. Came to that house and they decided, and I had kind of quit visiting with him, I decided I'm done. And, and we had got to Perkins, Oklahoma and that was a, uh, we'd encountered a, a nice church group there and we'd started attending there because we was there long enough. We was there for three or four months. And, you know, we was meeting with real Christians, true Christians, and, you know, we were really being blessed. And so uh, here came this whole group of ministers and they were coming there to, they decided that they was going to, I don't know if they had decided uh, openly, but underneath they had decided to set me free. And they wanted me back in preaching. So they, they told me, they said, I want you, we want you to get back to Rich Hill just as quick as you can, back home, and, and we want to be there when you get there. So after I finished the job, went back, got back there. We got there, and just about the next Sunday here they came, several of the conference counseling committee which it wasn't a home congregation. It was, you know, people from other states and places that came. And they, they said some nice things about me and then had a ballot vote by the whole church about their confidence of whether I should be restored as a minister. The ballot vote come back 100% that I should be restored. 100%. That was the most discouraging thing that I'd ever seen because now I knew for positive there's nothing to none of it. They had this great big concern. They took me off all these committees. They wouldn't let me preach. And nothing changed. My opinion was just the same or stronger. And now everything was fine. So now they were saying, okay, now go on, continue preaching. So they said, now you can start going back and, uh, and get in with the staff again, the, the ministerial staff in the congregation. So they'd get ready to have a staff meeting and about problems in the church they was discussing. So they told me, you know, come to that meeting. Well, here I came. They was discussing a certain situation with a certain person that was from the community there and they were getting ready to expel him. One of the older ministers said, you know, I think we've done everything we can for him. Well, I knew about the situation. I looked at him, I said, well, I don't think we've done anything. We ain't even, we've never talked to him about Jesus. I said, when are we gonna start that? I said, if we ain't talked to him about Jesus and who he really is and how he cares about him, I said, how are we gonna help him? They were just telling the man everything he was doing wrong in his life, his whole life was wrong. You know, but they weren't telling him about who the answer was. It got real quiet when I said that. 
uh, about a week later, the big dogs, the big, <laughs> the counseling committee showed back up, and I was on repentance then. Whoa. For that statement. Whoa, you're kidding. No, that's, <laughs> that was it. And then, of course, I wasn't backing up on those kind of statements. I believed that with all my heart. I, I knew people needed Jesus. They don't, they don't need these regulations. They don't need all this, this authority over them. They need Jesus is who they need. Right. And, and when they seen I wasn't backing up on that, see, so these other staff members, people right around me, was the ones that was turning me in. That was part of it, you know. The more you can convince the person that they're, they're a, a bad person and the more you can get them to understand how bad they really are, the better they can be. Yeah. And it's, it's completely a false. Yeah. There's, there's no gospel. The right. gospel's not there. And I was already knowing it. I was knowing it then. Yeah. And so when we come to those situations, I would say, I can't do this. But if you don't talk to them about Jesus, yeah. the, the, the man was a troubled man, really. Yeah. He had had drug, a lot of drug use in the past and what have you, and so he was just a troubled man that needed help. He needed the gospel. He needed Jesus, that's yeah, all. Exactly. They didn't want me saying that kind yeah. of stuff because this guy what didn't look right in their church. Right. See, he had probably had some, uh, some actions and some things he was saying that didn't, didn't fit in, you know. So instead of coming to him in a gospel way, better to get rid of him. So then, the, was that the last straw then for you? No, it went quite a long, quite a while longer than that yet. But there was a lot of other visits and talks about a lot yeah. of different things. Okay. But that gives us an idea. It it's a process to get out. It takes a long time, and it's very painful, very painful. Yeah. Because I was involved everywhere, you know, and and. And I had a lot of friends across, you know, especially, like I said, most of them was ordained friends, but it was all across, you know, the U.S. and Canada. So 